Hi, what's up folks? My name is Jeff Kotz and I'm here today to talk to you about a survey of probability concepts. Now, if you recognize any of these slides that you see, it's likely that you recognize this textbook too. Basic Statistics for Business and Economics by Lind Marshall and Wathan. If you don't have this textbook or you don't have these PowerPoint slides, hopefully what you get out of this video will still be worthwhile. The things we're going to talk about today is the first half of the things on this list. For those of you following along with chapter five, uh, I'm dividing this series up into a, a, a pair of things. Uh, we're gonna get through joint probability today. We're gonna talk about what probability is and the different types of probability. We're gonna talk about the different characteristics of events. We're gonna define joint probability and then we're gonna end there with this video. In the next uh, second half of chapter five, we're gonna talk about how to apply all of those rules looking at different types of probabilities. Probability itself is a value between zero and one, inclusive, so it can be zero or it can be one, describing the relative possibility, the probability, the, the perhapsedness, the chance, the likelihood that something is going to happen. For example, a probability of zero means that something definitely won't occur, like the sun blowing up right now. Nope, it didn't happen. Uh, the probability of one it means that it will definitely happen. So it will definitely rain in Florida this year, and it will definitely fall when I drop my hat. So a zero is definitely not. One is definitely will. Any number in between there can talk about the relative likelihood of things happening. Likelihood of a horse winning the Kentucky Derby. The likelihood of getting a single head in a single toss of a coin. This is, we know, 50-50, or one-half, or 50%. As we can see right here expressed as a decimal, it's 0.5. We need to find some terms in order to keep going along with our discussion of probability, and those three terms are experiment, outcome, and event. And they describe the context around a particular probability. So experiment is what you do. It could be a flip of the coin, a roll of the dice. It could be pulling a marble out of a bag of marbles, or a jelly bean out of a bag of jelly beans, or a poker chip out of a bag of poker chips. Bags of things and lots of pulling. Well, it's what you do to generate an outcome. Now, the outcome is the singular particular result of an event. It's the green jelly bean that you picked. It's the head. It's the two on the die. It's the thing that happens at the end of the experiment. Now any number of outcomes can occur and we can group them together into things called events. So let's say I wanted to get the event a roll of an even number on a single six-sided die. Well the possible outcomes are one, two, three, four, five, and six possible outcomes. Those are the things that can happen at the end of the experiment, at the end of me rolling the die. The event of even number is if the outcome of two, four, or six should occur. Now, events, again, are collections of outcomes. There's a number of different ways that we can start now talking about probability once we've got the context of experiment, outcome, and event. The three ways that we assign probability are either classically, empirically, or subjectively. Now, classical probability is built on the assumption that all outcomes are equally likely. You flip a coin, we've got two outcomes, heads or tails. Provided it's a fair coin, both outcomes are equally likely. Empirical probability is often used to try to make some prediction about the future based on what happened in the past. It's the probability of an event happening being the fraction of the time similar events happened in the past. So if I know consistently that someone, a baseball player, is a 300 hitter, I might think that that person has a 3 in 10 chance of getting a hit the next time he's at bat. A subjective concept of probability is the likelihood, probability, of a particular event happening that is assigned by an individual, by the subject, it's subjectivity, based on whatever information is available. So if I want to try to predict the Super Bowl winner, I might say, well, that team has the best offense and that team has the best defense and there might be bad weather, but it might be good weather and that guy's playing hurt and that guy's coming off. Whatever information I come up with, I'm going to decide that one team has a higher probability than, of winning than the other. That's my subjective probability. It will vary from person to person because it's subjective. 
Unlike classical probability, person to person, I sure hope that coin is still 50-50. The empirical probability, well, we're basing it on measurements that we've had in the past. Those measurements, again, should help predict the likelihood that something is going to happen again. Now, provided that we have the same measurements, I should hope that me and any other random person is going to have the same empirical probability. Though, if we have different data sets, done different amounts of investigation, did our math wrong, whatever the case may be, we should all consistently have the same empirical and classical probabilities, though subjective probability will differ. Classical probability, like we said, is based on the equal likelihood of things happening. Here we're rolling a die and we're looking for the event, again, collection of possible outcomes, that an even number of spots will appear on the top of the die. Two and four and six are the three possible favorable outcomes. One, two, three, four, five, six is the total number of possible outcomes. It's classical probability. Empirical probability, the probability of an event happening being the fraction of time similar things happened in the past, is something that we often achieve through measurement. We've talked about sample and population in the past. A lot of times you'll try to make some probabilistic generalization to your population from your sample. You say if it occurs this likely for the small group, maybe it will occur similarly likely with the large group. The empirical approach of probability is based on what's called the law of large numbers. Get that in just a second. We often, like I mentioned, use this to make a prediction or draw an inference about a population. And the key to establishing probabilities empirically is that we want a large number of observations. A large number of observations will always provide a more accurate estimate of the probability. The law of large numbers says over a large number of trials, the empirical probability of an event will approach its true probability. So true probability is not one of the three probabilities that we talked about. Well, let's try to illustrate it with a couple of examples and see what we can get at. Uh, in 2003, the space shuttle Columbia tragically exploded, and it was the second disaster in 123 space missions. If we want to calculate the probability of a successful flight, all we need to do is count the total number of successful flights, which would be 121, divide it by the total number of flights altogether. 121 out of one. 121 out of 123 is about 98 percent so about 98 percent of the flights in the past have occurred successfully so we might expect a 98 percent chance of success in future events i mentioned earlier that the law the law of large numbers is key to establishing probability probabilities empirically a large number of observations will provide a more accurate estimate uh, than a small number of observations so we might have this occurrence. Let's say the number of trials is over there on the left-hand side, and we're flipping a coin. And when we flip this coin, we want to count the number of times heads should occur. Now, if it's a balanced coin, we would say that it's we would say that it's likely about half of the time that that's uh, going to end up heads. So we flip it ten times, we might expect five heads. Well, I just so happened to flip a coin 10,000 times, keeping track of how many times heads occurred. And I wrote it down. That was the important part. Uh, for the first time I flipped the coin, I got zero heads. The relative frequency of heads, zero heads out of one trial, means that the probability I would establish there is zero. Now, we know the true probability or the classical probability for a coin with an equal likely occurrence of head or tails, uh, that zero is not close to that. So I flipped the coin nine more times. I achieved a total of three heads. Well, three out of 10 is 30%. 30% is closer to 50%, what we know to be the classical or true probability, then was zero, so we're getting better. So I just kept flipping the coin, and as you can see, I go down here. By the time I flipped the coin 10,000 times, my thumb was numb, and I had 5,027 heads. That's a relative frequency of just over 50%. Not exactly, but that estimate, 0.5027, is much, much, much closer than the 
probability of 0 0.00 or 0 0.30. The more trials I executed, the more likely I was to achieve the true probability. In this case, there is a real true probability of flipping a coin and getting ahead, and that's 50. It's 0 0.50, 50 percent. It's true because it's the classical sense. For a lot of things that occur in the world, there may not be a classical probability associated with it, but there's still a real, true likelihood that something is going to happen. Well, we need to make a series of observations to try to approach and find out what that is. The more observations we make, the more likely our conclusions will represent what the truth is. Subjective probability, like I mentioned before, trying to figure out based on the information that I have available. It may not be the same as everyone else, but the subjective probability is used if there's little or no past experience, so we can't establish it empirically, or we might not know how many possibilities there are, so establishing it classically is not a, not a possibility either. But if I wanted to, let's say, estimate the likelihood that the Patriots will play in the Super Bowl next year, I think I'm likely to say that's lower than the Steelers might make it to the Super Bowl next year, not because of any sort of empirical evidence based on the past. It's just that I happen to be a Steelers fan, and I always think they're going to make the Super Bowl because they're the best team in the league. Uh, two, you might estimate the likelihood you will be married before the age of 30. I mean, that's sort of guessed based on your personality what you think might happen. I know that that true probability is zero, because I'm older than 30 and not married, so it's impossible. Zero. We might estimate the likelihood that the budget deficit will be reduced in half in the next 10 years. I'm just going to say it's really, really low, because I don't think it's on anybody's priorities or anything's going to get done. That's just my opinion. Again, it's subjective. In sum, there's objective and subjective approaches to probability. Objective ones are based on a real proper measurement or our understanding of an equally likely outcome. Classical probability is based on equally likely outcomes. Empirical probability is based on relative frequencies based on our empirical evidence, our observed evidence. Subjective probability is based on the available information in the person, in the subject. So we've got uh, classical probability, we've got empirical probability, and we've got subjective probability, all of which describe our different ways that we can make predictions or understandings of probabilities of different events. We also need to describe how those events are related to one another. And here's where we get into the three concepts of mutual exclusivity, independence, and collective exhaustiveness. Mutually exclusive means that two events cannot co-occur. Remember that events are collections of outcomes. We can go back to the classic set of outcomes from the roll of a single die. One, two, three, four, five, six. I can say over here, I have an event. This event is even numbers. What's the probability of that? Eh, 0.5. Not important what the probability is so much as we know the event is defined as the collection of outcomes rolling a two, a four, or six. That one's over here. Over here, I'm going to describe another event. Now, this event is uh, a number less than six. So one, two, three, four, five. That's this event. If any of those outcomes overlap, these events are not mutually exclusive. Well, the outcome two and the outcome four are present in both events. Therefore, they are not mutually exclusive. If I put odd numbers over here as one event, even numbers over here as another event, a number cannot be both odd and even. Therefore, there is no overlap, and we have mutually exclusive events. Independence is established if the occurrence of one event does not affect the occurrence of the other. Two examples. First of all, the old adage that dice have no memory. If you're at a craps table and you think you're running hot, sure, maybe you got three sevens in a row, and that's awesome. But it's not because of the dice. It's just because of, well, let's say luck. The dice have no memory. Each roll and each roll after that roll and each roll after that roll doesn't affect the role before it, the role after it. That's what makes them independent. 
We might say that two events are dependent if the selection of one causes a change in the selection of the other. For example, if I'm deciding what I'm going to wear to work, I'll go to my closet and say, hmm, I could wear a short sleeve dress shirt or a long sleeve dress shirt. Well, I'm going to wear a long sleeve one because I don't have any short ones, but let's say I can make that decision. Uh, you know, we're talking about a, a polo shirt or something like that. But if I wanted to look for the probability that I was going to select a blue shirt, I might not have any blue polos, but I do have an assortment of blue long sleeve button down shirts. In this case, the two events of selecting the type of shirt, long sleeve or short sleeve, and selecting the color of the shirt are not independent because if I start by selecting long sleeve dress shirts, I know I've got a bunch of blue ones. If I start by selecting a polo shirt, I know that I don't have any blue polo shirts. So when you have two events there, they have some relation to one another, then they are called dependent events. And that's a big importance when we start talking about the multiplication rule in the second half of chapter five. The third thing here that we're talking about is collectively exhaustive, a collectively exhaustive event. So if I have two events, let's go back to the classic rolling of the die, and I have one event over here, odd numbers, one event over here, even numbers. If every single outcome, one, two, three, four, five, six, is assigned to an event, doesn't matter, just has to be assigned to an event, I could say those events are collectively exhausted. Odd numbers, even numbers, one, three, five, two, four, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, all outcomes are in events. If I have an event over here, rolling less than three, I have event over here, rolling greater than five. Well, over here I only have one and two. Over here I only have six. Three, four, and five, those outcomes aren't assigned anywhere. I do not have collectively exhaustive events. Mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive, and independent. Those are the three things that we need to keep in mind about different probabilities in order to use the rules that we see in the second half. The last thing I want to do right now is define the term joint probability. Now this is what happens if you have two different events that do have some overlap so that they are not mutually exclusive. So in one case here, we can look at uh, selecting a king of hearts. That's the A and B on the left hand side. Now, selecting a heart and selecting a king, those things are not independent. That overlap there is, or I'm sorry, a king and a heart, those are not mutually exclusive events. Kings and hearts are not mutually exclusive. So if you select one and you select the other, uh, that doesn't mean that there's no overlap. That overlap there is in fact the king of hearts. Or let's say you're going to Disney World, or, or, or I'm sorry, you're going to Florida. Maybe you go to Disney World when you're in Florida. Let's say there's a 60% chance you go to Disney World when you're in Florida. There's a 50% chance that you go to Busch Gardens. There could be some overlap there. It's possible that you go to both. That overlap there is the joint probability. Joint probabilities are going to be important when we get to the second half and we start talking about uh, rules of addition. So far, we've gotten right up to joint probability there, set down a lot of definitional framework. When we get to the second half of chapter five here, we'll explore how to use all these concepts and probabilities for particular calculations. So that's the end of the first half of chapter five. I never know how to end.